And so I wanted to give wanted to take a few minutes to introduce Heidi to our audience today. Heidi Heitkamp served in the U.S. Senate from 2013 through 2019. She was the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate from North Dakota. Previous to that, though, she served as North Dakota's Attorney General from 1992 through 2000 and the Tax Commissioner from 1986 to 1992. Um, Heidi also ran for governor in 2000. Since leaving the Senate, Heidi became a contributor at CNBC, a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Institute of Politics, and she co-founded the One Country Project, which is an organization that is aimed at connecting with rural voters. Um, and I think, you know, because of the crowd that we're speaking with today, in addition to Heidi's service as an elected official, I also wanted to point out that she worked in government before running for office. Um, she interned with the United States Congress, with the North Dakota Legislature, and also worked as a staff attorney with the Environmental Protection Agency and with the North Dakota Tax Commissioner before she ran for office herself. Um, of course, these are just a few of the highlights. Um, but this conversation is meant to hopefully dream up some interest from our membership in running for office. And so with that, Heidi, we're really excited that you would take some time to visit with us today and hopefully inspire others to maybe follow in your footsteps. So maybe you can just start with telling us a little bit more about what inspired you or called you to run for office when you first took that leap. You know, uh, I think it's really interesting because um, there, I find that politicians find two paths to elected office, those who always just wanted to be an elected official and those who find their way because they care deeply about public policy and see what role political discourse and politics plays. For me, it was the later, um, the latter. I, I, I did not come from an, uh, you know, an extremely political, uh, ex political family. Um, my parents, my mom was engaged and my grandparents were engaged in the Democratic NPL party, but it wasn't something that any of us ever aspired to, to do or be. Um, but I got very involved uh, back in the late 70s in the environmental movement and taking a look at what was happening at that time. Literally, our, our, our rivers were starting on fire. Our landfills were exploding. You couldn't eat fish out of the Great Lakes. And it just seemed to me like it was time to do something about that. That along with what you would call traditional women's issues um, drove my interest in public policy, which yeah. is why I went, I went to Lewis and Clark Law School. Um, it's a law school in Oregon that specialized in environmental policy. That's how we ended up at EPA. And I always say, how did I end up in politics? An election. Yeah, you know, we're moving along, um, doing just just fine, you know, thinking about what's the next steps of cleaning up the water and cleaning up the air. And something happens like an election, Ronald Reagan got elected and totally changed how people, you know, the public policy around um, around environmental activism and environmental laws. And you might say, you know, I used to think, well, that's the law. The law is going to be administered the same by everybody. Well, that's not true. And so who sits in those, those jobs really matters. And so that's when I decided I would move home, get involved in politics, and, uh, but only as kind of that person behind the scenes helping elect people. And um, I got encouraged to run for office when I was the same age as a lot of you out there. My first statewide office was when I was 28 and that began my political career. But I really, I would say the motivation was, was public policy. Awesome, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, so when someone might be thinking about launching a campaign if they're you know they want to get involved they want to run for office they think that's their path who are the people that should be involved in that decision making process who are the people that are at that table when you're having that first conversation well the first conversation is you need to have with yourself and and it should be about motivation um what what motivates me to even think about this? What motivates me to want to do this? And if you're not motivated by a good idea, if you're not motivated by, by um, some kind of change that you wanna bring or better administration that you wanna bring, then you have to really question your, your motivation. Is this about just kind of having that job 
or is it about yeah. doing the job and bringing something new to it? And then obviously your spouse. Um, I think those of us who have been successful in politics, um, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say whether you're a male or a female, you're going to find a supportive spouse behind you. It's just too, the work is too hard. Mm -hmm. the, the, especially now the rancor is too loud and mean not to have that support. And then obviously you got to think about the impact on the rest of your family. Um, you know, for me, it was about trusted advisors like Kent Conrad and Byron Dorgan or Pomeroy, you know, Kylie, um, you know, people that you trusted to offer opinion. But at the end of the day, this, this is such a big impact, not only on you, but a huge impact on your family. Absolutely. Well, and that, you know, with that, thinking about, you said you were 28 when you first, first were elected, what are some of the challenges you faced throughout that time, particularly as a young woman, woman, because I think I'd like to think things have changed since then. And in some ways they have, but in a lot of ways they haven't. So just talk about some of the challenges that you faced. Well, I think, you know, I had the double whammy. I was young. I looked young. And um, I was a woman, I was 28, I was going all across the state of North Dakota. Um, I had the advantage of growing up in a small town and kind of watching that interaction, watching how people treated each other, how they tested each other. And I always tell a, a story about being in um, a small town and I walk up to a table and Kylie, you know this, cause you've done it, mm -hmm. handed out my campaign literature. And this old guy at the table says, why would I ever vote for you? you know, kind of looking at me and here I am, you know, kind of like my little dress for success suit on because that's, that was kind of the dress code at the time. And, and I looked around and I saw everybody else and I thought, well, that guy may not ever vote for me, but I might get some of the votes of the other guys sitting around this table. And I said to him, I said, because you're really smart and you're <laughs> going to vote for the uh, you know, the person with the best ideas who has the energy to lead the office into the next generation, you know, and, and I always the way I tell the story, and I think it's true, I didn't get his vote, because I think he was kind of embarrassed by that answer. But I might have picked up a few votes around that table, people who thought I had game. Um, when I ran, I was 44 when I ran for governor, and um, I was a young mom, my kids were 14 and 10. And people would ask me, and that's another big challenge for those of you who have kids, you know, taking a look, I think it's less so as I reach that senior citizens stage. Um, you know, I'm not going to judge a, a woman who is running for office. But I think at the time, which was 22 years ago, there was a lot of people out there who thought you couldn't be a young mom and actually do a good job of being a mother and a politician, especially governor, because that's a boy's job, right? And um, I had this one guy ask me, he said, you know, how old are your kids? With a lot of judgment about, you know, me abandoning the kids. And I, I said, they're the same age as John Hovens, and who is my opponent. And, and it kind of like, like, he just got this wide eyed look. And I said, you know, yeah. It, you, know, you don't ask him that question, but you do ask me that question. And I think, you, you know, one thing, whether you like her or not, one thing Hillary's race taught us is that this may not still be equal opportunity. We're going to have to keep working at it as women, especially young women, making sure that we're throwing some elbows and, and demanding a seat at the table. It's so critical, I think, to the future of this country to have those voices and you're seeing more and more of those people running, whether it's Katie Porter, who I think is an amazing congresswoman from California. If you don't follow her, follow her. She's, she's a single mom. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people bringing young kids into the dialogue because they've experienced it. They've experienced daycare, daycare challenges. They care about education. They care about you know, climate. They care about the things that affects their kids. Doesn't mean that men don't. But we bring a different sensibility, I think, to that dialogue. Absolutely. Yeah. And I so we want to think about the more technical side of, of campaigns now, too, um, because you've been through this enough to know. I know you know that side of this game really well. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the factors that potential candidates should be thinking about when they're looking at their path to victory? And on the flip side of that, is winning always the goal when you run a campaign? The, 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 the first thing I would say is, is authenticity is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. Your message has to be authentic. You have to believe in your message. You have to be enthusiastic about your message. You know, it used to be you would see 
people like me lead with, well, you got to be able to raise the money. I think now access to um, getting your content out in, in other ways other than 30 second ads, um, you know, you can't replace it. And if you're running for a local legislative race, you can't replace that knocking on the door. If you're running for a city council, you can't replace showing up at the legal women voter form. And so, you know, to me, it, that, that, that we have in the past overemphasized money and un underemphasized authenticity, genuineness of message and commitment to the job. And I think um, there are other ways you, you gotta be incredibly clever to get your content looked at. Um, and clever means you've got to believe in what you're saying. And it can't be, I always, and poor Kylie knows this because I lecture this every chance I get, but it can't be blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I ask people, why are you running? And if they start, well, you know, my blah, blah, you know, my, my, I, I want to give, I, and, and I, about three minutes into it, or not even, I don't even give them three minutes, I go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, convince me. Yeah, you're, you're all lawyers. You're going to be lawyers or you're already lawyers. You, you have learned advocacy skills. You have to advocate not just for yourself and who you are, you have to advocate for your ideas and why those are the best ideas. And I think um, for those of you who don't like politics, don't like this partisanship, look for a job that's nonpartisan on the school board, although those are becoming more and more partisan <laughs> yeah. now. Um, so look for a job that, that you don't have to declare one side or the other, but a good idea can get you elected and hard work can get you elected. And there's no way to replace that family commitment, your commitment and authenticity. So I would say, be authentic about who you are. If you, if you have something in your past that you wanna talk about, talk about it. People yeah. appreciate those stories and come with good ideas, come with novel, good ideas. And that um, can be a formula for sex success. And Kylie, you know, you, you raised such an important issue. When I ran in, um, in uh, 84, I ran on performance audits, revising the, the um, auditor's office. Guess what? After I lost, all of my ideas then were incorporated. So yeah. those good ideas can find their way into the marketplace of good ideas if you run a good campaign. Absolutely. Yes. And I appreciate that. And I think that's, you know, that's something I encourage candidates to think about often is you know, how can you change the conversation? You know, even if you know, going into this, it's an uphill battle. What are you bringing to the table to change that conversation for voters and constituents? Um, and I think that's really, really valuable. Um, Heidi, what is something that, you know, you've had a long career in public service. What's something you wish you would have known before all of this started? looking back over those years? I wish I would, I, I would tell my 28 year old person not to get your feelings hurt so easily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I talk about, you know, how when I got into it, I would win races by 80, uh, by 65% and wonder why the other 35 didn't like me. Yep. I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and toil and fret. I would say, you know, be true to yourself. Not everybody's going to like you. And, and the great thing when I ran for, for the Senate is I had leathered up. I mean, I was like, well, you know, we're going to give her a go. And if it doesn't work, if you don't like me, don't vote for me. I, I mean, I don't have time anymore um, for, for the naysayers. And, and the one thing with social media, I get asked this question all the time, especially by young women. I mean, how can I, I mean, this will be horrible. I said, don't look at it. And why are you giving all that power to the haters? Don't give power to the haters. And I think some, in some ways in my early career, even though it wasn't as kind of like vicious because of what's happening now in social media, I gave too much power to the haters and, and it, it affected, you know, kind of how you felt about yourself, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, it slowed you down. You have to listen to criticism. That's not the same as giving right. power to haters. So listen to criticism, but don't give power to haters. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a lesson I had to learn pretty quickly. So I appreciate that. Um, I think kind of as a wrap up, Heidi, as you're knowing, again, the audience here is young lawyers. What advice or what encouragement would you give to young lawyers as they think about ways to get involved in public life, whether that is through working for the government or running for office? Every lawyer is a public servant. You are an officer of the court. You represent the rule of law. You are, this is the career you've chosen. 
and you have a lot to give. And right now, um, whether, whether you believe it or not, our democracy is in peril and there's no more important group of people. I mean, there's a reason why Shakespeare said the first thing you do in a revolution is kill all the lawyers. It wasn't because <laughs> lawyers were bad people. It's because lawyers will enforce the rule of law. And so there is a necessity for your voice. We're seeing fewer and fewer lawyers in the public discourse in part because it's gotten so tough, but yeah. you are already an officer of the court. You already have an obligation to um, the rule of law, to the constitution. You swore an oath when you um, became uh, a lawyer. Um, and, and so take that oath one step further and think about all the things that you see that are wrong that need correction, that need to be fixed. You got into this line of work because you wanted to fix problems. This is a big problem we're having right now in political discourse. Absolutely, yes, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And again, thanks to everyone who's taking time out of their, their busy days to engage with us today and to watch this. Heidi, thank you so much for taking- You bet, Kylie. Us. We appreciate it. And for those watching, um, there are other conversations on the ABA Young Lawyers Division, Division Facebook Facebook page, excuse me, and we'll be sharing out this and all of those conversations at a later time. Thanks so much and have a good okay. rest of your day.